Thank you, Father. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 6, and we're going to, we're going to talk tonight about some scriptures that are hard to understand, and some people get them wrong because they are hard to understand. And we're going to see what they really mean from the original language, from the original Greek. The New Testament was written in Greek. At that time, the Greek was the, the universal language. So they wrote the New Testament in Greek. The Old Testament was written in primarily in Hebrew. And that was God's language, the language of God. And you know how many languages they spoke in the very beginning? <coughs> One. Probably wasn't English either. It wasn't English. I think it was Hebrew. I don't know. I would imagine so. Anyhow, there's lots of translations that get that get some scriptures wrong. So we're going to look at some scriptures tonight that don't really fit in with the rest of the Word of God according to how you read them in King James translation or even other translations. And we're going to see how what these these really mean. I want you to understand, first off, that God made you a free moral agent with a free will. You have a free will. Yes. You can do what you choose to do. Nobody can make you do something. Even though there was that comedian years ago that said, the devil made me do it. <laughs> the devil made, never made a person do anything. They chose to do what they did. You either, either have a choice to walk after life, to walk after good and life, or evil and death. Those are the two choices. God set the choice, even from the very beginning, God set the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of, and the tree of life in the middle of the Garden of Eden, in the very middle of the Garden. Those two trees, now they were told they could eat of any tree in the Garden except that one tree. He said, you should not eat of it. He said, lest you shall surely die on the day that you eat thereof. So they had a choice, life or death. We still have the choice every day. We live. We have a choice to do what's right or to do what's wrong. We have a choice to walk after the spirit or after the flesh. And so we're going to talk about that today, tonight. We're going to talk about some scriptures that are hard to, to understand and they're misunderstood by many. And, and we're, going to, we're going to get them right tonight. So let's look at John, 1 John chapter 3. We're going to start with verse 1, but the scripture we're really going to hit is verse 6, okay? Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not, talking about Jesus. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Sound I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, and Jesus is coming soon, when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in himself, everybody who calls themselves a Christian has this hope in themselves. They purify himself. They purify themselves. Even as he is pure. That's Jesus. Now, can you really walk and live like Jesus? Jesus said you could. Jesus enters into you, and God shed the spirit of his son into your heart that he might strengthen you, that he might enable you to walk like he walked, to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's all I want to be. It's like Jesus. I just want to be like Jesus. Amen. I just want to do what Jesus would do. And though I can't do it on my own, that's why God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to come and live inside me. Yes. His Spirit to live inside me and to live inside you. And so God sent His Son to live inside you. You can live in Jesus and He can live in you. You can do what God said we could do. All right? But you've got to choose to do what's right. Verse 4, whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. 
The word sin is a, here is a word that means to miss the mark. Now, there are sins. I mean, we miss it sometimes. All of us miss it sometimes. But there are sins that won't separate. There are sins that will separate you from God, and there are not sins that are not unto death that will not separate you from God. I mean, just because you miss something, that's what the Bible calls that sin. But it doesn't mean you're going to hell because of that. You understand what I'm saying? The Bible is clear with that. It says, it says, I believe in one of these Johns. <laughs> it says, it says that there are sins unto death and sins not unto death. And we should, those who are committing sins unto death, we should, not unto death, we should forgive them. He said, but sin that is unto death, sins that are unto death, we should not forgive them. Sins that are not unto death, we should forgive them. But sins that are not unto death, we should not forgive them. I mean, get, that's God's business to do that. But we're supposed to keep ourselves pure and sanctified and holy as He is holy. But whosoever commits sin transgresseth also the law, for trans sin is the transgression of the law. And you know that He was manifest to take away our sins, and in Him, that word in, is a word that denotes a fixed position or a location. You are in Living Word Church building tonight. That's where you are. You are in this building tonight. We call it Living Word Church. The building is not the church. The people are the church. But we are here. We're located in this place, but we can walk, we're going to walk out the door at the end of the service. At least most of us are. I had one night that we got a call. We found out somebody had stayed in the building. They got locked into the building. They really could have got out. We have, you can just unlock the front door, get out. But anyhow, so you can choose to walk out. You just say when you Jesus. You can choose to walk out of Jesus. If you choose not to obey His word, then you're walking out of Jesus. You're walking away from Him. That's right. There's a scripture in the New Testament talking to Christians that were living for God that says God will never leave you nor forsake you. Yet there's an Old Testament scripture talking to king, a prophet came to these kings. He said, if you seek God, you, you, will, you will be found of him. Now Jesus said, seek and you shall find, right? But the word also says, he didn't went to say, he said, now if you, if you run after God, he'll, if you'll seek God's ways, he, he won't leave you. He'll never leave you. He said, but if you leave him, he will leave you. He'll forsake you. That's, that's a scripture in the Old Testament. So that scripture that he'll never leave you nor forsake you is quoting that Old Testament scripture. But he's talking to people who are living for God. That's right. As long as you're with your heart living for God, he will not leave you. If you decide to go live for the devil, if you decide to walk after the flesh, you will go die and go to hell if you, if you die in your sin, in the sins that you're doing, evil sins. If you choose to do those evil things, you will die in your sin, and for the sin that you committed, you will die. What about God's grace? Well, God's grace means Jesus freely provided a way of escape so you can live free from sin, so you cannot sin. Paul said, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? He said, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin continue to live therein? Say, I'm dead to sin. Dead to sin. Now, we've got to reckon ourselves to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. We've got to do that. That's our responsibility, to reckon that. And that's God's responsibility to enable us, by His power, to walk that way. And God's, God gives you that ability, because He said so in His Word. So we stand on the Word of God by faith, takes faith, that's believing God and acting upon what God says, do what God says. Act upon what God says. Faith is a verb. How many knows what a verb is? It's an action word. Now, I wasn't very good in English, but I knew, I do know that verbs were action words. It's doing something. By faith, Abraham believed God. By faith, Abraham followed God. By faith, Abraham went to a land that he said, I'll show you where you're going to go. And by faith, he just packed up and went, not knowing where he was going. By faith, Noah built the ark. When God said, it's going to pour down water out of the sky, when it never, ever had rain in the history of mankind. And God said, it's going to pour down water out of the sky. 
I want you to build this giant boat in the middle of the land. He said, there's going to be a great flood. By Noah had to have faith in what God said to build that boat. <coughs> Took him a long time to build that boat. Yeah, yeah. He was 500 years old when God told him. He was 600 years old when he finished. And the Bible says Noah was a preacher of righteousness. So all those wicked people that were around, and there was a lot of them, in 1,656 years, a lot of people developed. You know why? Because God said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So they were busy having kids. You have a lot, you have a lot of kids in 1,556 years. When the, when the flood happened, there was 1,656 years because it took 100 years for the flood to happen. The reason I know that is because I added all that up. You can add it up by the genealogies. I used to, when I get to those genealogies, I just start skipping. I said, Lord, well, why do you put all those genealogies in there? For God wants us to know a timetable. He wants us to understand that when, when, what happened, when it happened. So he put those genealogies in there. And he said, such and such lived so many years, and they died, and they had two kids, and they had daughters and sons. And you can have a lot of kids if you live up to be 1,000 years old. Most of those before the flood lived to be over 900 years old. That was the average lifespan before the flood. It was over 900 years. God found out what happens when people have long, long, long lifespans like that. He said he looked at their hearts, and the intents of their hearts were only evil continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <coughs> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that means that Noah served God. The Bible says he was righteous in all his generations. He was holy. He was righteous. He walked with God. He was one of only two men. The Bible says he walked with God. And they were Enoch and Noah. They walked with God. Enoch was not. He just God took him. It says in Hebrews chapter 11, Enoch, that Enoch didn't see death. He, had, he never died. According to the scriptures, Enoch never died. He just was, was not, and God took him. Hallelujah. Come on, verse 5. Mm -hmm. And you know he was manifest to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. In Jesus is no sin. It's no unrighteousness in Jesus Christ. Located in Jesus. So if you are located in Jesus, and I'm located in Jesus, and we get into sin, what happens? And we're not located in Jesus. And not in Jesus no more. Right? In Him is no sin. But we can repent. We can confess our sins. And turn away from our sins. And then we're right back in Jesus. Hallelujah. Nobody accidentally sins. To know to do good and to do it not, to him it is sin. And the Holy Spirit is reproving everybody in the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So every person that says, well, I didn't know any better, they knew better. Because the Holy Ghost is dealing with them. The Holy Ghost, if you're, thinking, if you're doing evil, the Holy Ghost is letting you know you are doing evil. Hallelujah. We need to walk in the truth. God's word is the truth. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Father. Yeah, we're getting to the verse I'm going to preach on. <laughs> Whosoever abideth in him, now the word abide means stay. Whosoever stays in him, sinneth not. In other words, you got a choice to walk after the spirit or to walk after the flesh. How many of y'all ever heard Don Burke? You've heard Don. He preaches on walking after the Spirit, following the direction of the Spirit. And we really need, that is one of the most important things we can do, is to learn the voice of the Spirit so we can walk after the Spirit, not after the flesh. Because the flesh lusts against the Spirit. If there's always a battle between flesh and Spirit. Remember those cartoons years ago? They'd have like a little devil on one shoulder, an angel on the other shoulder. Do you remember those? And the devil's saying, do this. And the angel's saying, don't do that. That's kind of how it works. The devil's <coughs> pulling on us to do evil. Why is he doing that? Because the devil wants you to go.
go to hell with him. He knows where he's going to spend all of eternity. God has created a lake of fire and brimstone that will burn forever and ever. And he's casting Satan and his angels in there. And whoever follows him is going there to live for eternity. All people will be resurrected, both the righteous and the unrighteous, into immortal bodies in the very end. We're all going to get immortal bodies. It's just where you're going to spend eternity. You're either going to spend eternity with God and his angels, and Jesus and all your other brothers and sisters in Christ, or you're going to spend eternity with Satan and his angels and all that bunch. It doesn't really matter what we believe because God's word is truth. The word of God is truth. Everything in the Bible is true. So we have to determine in our heart, I'm going to follow God no matter what. I'm going to do what God says no matter what. And we have to believe the truth of God's word and we need to, if we don't know the truth of God's word, we need to listen in church. And when somebody's preaching the word of God with the Holy Ghost, and listen to, to what the word of God says, and then apply it to your life, the Holy Ghost will reveal that the word is true to you. The Holy Spirit will. He's there with you to, to reprove you, to help you. Jesus said when the Holy Ghost comes, he will teach you all things. Paul said, told Timothy, he said, he said, that same anointing that's in you will teach you all things. You need not any man to teach you. We don't have to have anybody. If you're a minister, you don't have to need, you don't need anybody to teach you because God will teach you by the Holy Spirit. And he'll do that. But you've got to surrender your life to Jesus and let him do that. I mean, if you're just a Christian, just a Christian, that's a... If you're just a son of God, if you're just a child of God, just a child of God, if you're a child of God, that means you're an heir of God. And you're an heir of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You're co-laborers together with him. Hallelujah. He's there to help you. He's there to strengthen you. He's there to lift you up when you fall down. All you have to do is call out unto the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved means delivered. It comes from the same Greek word, sozo, which means delivered. But salvation means deliverance. Jesus came to bring deliverance to the world. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the dunamis, miraculous power of God unto salvation deliverance to everyone who has faith believeth. And faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So we're hearing the word of God tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. Whosoever. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now listen, this is the next part that I'm really going to hit tonight. Whosoever sinneth hath not. The word hath is not in the Greek. That's a past tense word. But this is what it says. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now a lot of people teach that. Well, if you are a Christian, that means if you get into sin, that means it's really not sin to you. You know, the Bible says God has no respect for persons. God's not going to let one adulterer go to heaven and the person he's sleeping with go to hell. That would be an unrighteous God. Let's say this adulterer when the word says, Jesus said there will be two in the bed, one will be taken, the other left. He wasn't talking about people that were having sexual immorality with each other. He was talking about just two people. Paul said if you have an, unbel an unbeliever that you're married to and you get saved, he said you can stay with them. Maybe you'll help them get saved. Maybe you'll help them get delivered. Who knows? Maybe your life will help them. Sometimes that happens. That's, but the word does say we shouldn't be une, unequally yoked together with unbelievers. So if you're if you're looking for a man or a woman, don't don't go with somebody that's not even a Christian. It's not living for God because they'll pull you down. Usually, that's what happens. Whosoever seen that hath not seen him, neither known him. Now this that is that is not what this actually says in the Greek. What it actually says in the Greek is he who sins, the Greek word 
It's for seeing. It's a word that means to stare, to keep your eyes focused upon. It's from another Greek word that puts it like this. It's to gaze, that is, with wide open, wide eyes opened, as, as something remarkable. In other words, we're keeping our eyes focused on Jesus, and as long as we keep our eyes focused on Jesus with our eyes wide open, as in wonder of what he's done for us, as long as we keep our eyes wide open to Jesus, then we'll, we'll be safe from getting off into sin. That's right. We won't miss the moment. But Peter... You remember when Peter was walking on the water? Right in the middle of the storm? And he got his eyes off Jesus. Mm -hmm. And started looking at the wind and the big waves. I mean, the guy's walking on water. And when he started looking <laughs> at those other things, it says, and he was afraid. That's why the word says, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not, fear not. It's in there a whole bunch of times. Why? Fear destroys faith. Fear that wipes out faith. Amen. Fear not. Jesus said, wherefore did you doubt? Fear brings doubt and unbelief. But as soon as he called out, immediately, the Bible says, Jesus reached down and picked him up and walked him back to the boat. Jesus will pick you up when you cry out. He's right there for you. Just cry out to the Lord. If you miss it, just cry out to God. Say, Lord, help me. Lord, forgive me. Lord, strengthen me so I don't do that anymore. And then keep your eyes fixed on Jesus from then on. Amen. I think Peter learned a lesson that day. You see, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. He said, Lord, if this be you, bid me to come on to the water with you. And Jesus said, come. That's all he said, come. And Peter jumped out of the boat and started walking on the water. And the Bible says he walked on the water. And one night, or day, I, I sat here in the church and I didn't expect anybody to, <coughs> to say they'd walked on water because I'd never walked on water, never known anybody who had walked on water. And so I said, is there anybody here that's walked on water? And Brother Jones raised his hand. <laughs> didn't you, Brother Jones? I did. And I did walk on water. And he did walk on water. And when he said that, I thought, man, he's a mighty man of faith. And then what'd you tell me? It was a cold, cold day. It was a cold, cold day. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I've walked on water too. <laughs> up in Minnesota, I used to drive a semi truck, and up in Minnesota, there's actually cars and trucks will drive out on the ice, mm -hmm. on lakes. And they do fishing out there, and the water gets, the ice gets so thick on the lakes that they can actually drive vehicles on. Isn't that something? Yeah, they make a road out They make, they make, yeah. they, they put sheds out there, fishing sheds out there. Who tests the ice you start with? I don't know. They, before I drove on it, I'd make sure the stuff was pretty solid. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Glory to God. So really what this scripture is saying is that if you get off track, it's because you've got your eyes off of Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Thank you, Bob. I'm going to look at some more scriptures. Turn with me to... Uh, turn with me to Galatians. Chapter 5. Verses 16 and 17. Thank you, Father. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Now first I'm going to read this in the King James Version, which is one of my favorite versions. That's, that's what I always studied when I was a kid, and that's what I grew up studying, and that's mostly the way I know the Scriptures, but a lot of them I, I know, I've known several translations because I've studied different translations. So we've got to... The word, remember, it wasn't written... By King James, who did not read the, read, write the scriptures. The King James translation was written in 1611. That's been a few hundred years back. But Jesus, this, the original writings were written like almost 2,000 years back. And so 
we want to go to what you know was really inspired by God. I heard a guy on the radio, he said, well, if the King James Version was good enough for Paul, the Apostle Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> well, the Apostle Paul didn't have the King James Version no. of the Bible. So nobody did until 400 years ago. But a lot of things have changed in the last 400 years. So Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. You know, we just read about the Spirit, lust against the flesh, and the flesh against the Spirit, and the two are contrary to the other. And then, that's what this can really say here. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, a lot of once saved, always saved people, they'll take hold of that and say, well, we can't do what we'd like to do anyhow. The Apostle Paul said that. And then in Romans chapter 7, the Apostle Paul says, the things I would like to do, I can't do. Those things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. And so then they quote those scriptures. The only problem with that is in chapter 6, right before that, he said, how can we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. He said, how shall we that are dead to sin continue to live therein? He said, I've been dead and buried in the grave with Jesus, and I've been raised up together with him in newness of life. He said, therefore, reckon ye yourselves indeed to be dead unto sin, but alive unto God through Christ Jesus. And he said that in the verse right before this. Now, we've got to understand that the scriptures were not written in chapters and verses. They were not. They were just letters that Paul wrote to the churches. And Paul, Peter, and John, and James, they were letters they wrote to the churches, to Christians. But in Romans chapter 7, he goes on at the end of that chapter. He said, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? He said, only through Jesus Christ. In other words, that was when he was in death. That was when he was trying to live for God right under the old covenant. There was no strength and power in the blood of bulls and goats. It says, in Hebrews, it says in Hebrews, there was no power in the blood of bulls and goats to take away my sin. There was no power to take away our sins in the blood of bulls and goats, but there was power in Jesus to take away your sins, and in him is no sin. Jesus came to deliver you from the power of sin. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But put your trust in him. All your trust in him. Say what God says. Do what God says. Set your heart, I'm going to do what God says. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, most translations translate like that. However, one translation actually gets it right. It's called the Modern King James Translation. Modern King James Version. And this is how it puts it. I say then, walk in the spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to the other. And that's it's the same as the other. Then it goes on to say, Lest whatsoever you may will, these things you do. It's a big difference. Instead of saying, You can't do what you want to do, that says, Whatever you choose to do, that's what you do. We all struggle with, with that battle between flesh and spirit. We've got to crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. And those that are, are, that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. James says, if you walk at, James says, when you, when you sin, it's because you have, you've let the lusts of the flesh take control of your body, take control of your life. And you, and when, when you lust, he said, and lust, he said, when it's finished, it brings forth death. When you sin, it's because of lust of the flesh. And the devil works on your flesh. It's kind of like the little angel, little devil. Mm -hmm. Kill the little devil. Walk with the angel. Walk with God. Amen. I want to be like Noah. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Enoch. Mm -hmm. That walked with God. Hallelujah. We can do Amen. that. We can walk with God. Yes. I got time to do a few more scriptures. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 1.
verses 28, and then, then we'll look at Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Somebody laugh. Now, I've got to admit, I, I, when I was young and went to Bible college, I believed this because of replenish. How many know what replenish means? It means to refill. But that's what it means now. But it's not, it's not what it meant 400 years ago. It meant to fill. 400 years ago, it meant to fill. And so when King James translated this replenish, it means the word Greek, the Hebrew word literally means to fill. But when it says replenish, and I know what replenish means, means now it means to refill. The words have changed. So we need to really see what the truth is in the Word of God. Everywhere in the Old Testament, Old Testament was written in Hebrew. Everywhere in the Old Testament where this word were translated replenish, every other place, and there's hundreds of places this word, Hebrew word is used. Every other place, except for two places, it says to fill. That's what it means to fill. And because of this word, it's primarily because of this word, it has become all kinds of weird doctrines. Yep. People are saying the earth's billions and billions of years old, and, and animals lived millions and millions of years ago, and dinosaurs you lived millions and millions of years. Now they're finding dinosaurs with actually skin on them and blood in their bodies. Dinosaurs. How can it be blood that's millions of years old? It can't be. How can it be skin that's millions of years old? There can't be. After a few thousand years, there's nothing left. <coughs> ashes to ashes and dust to dust. That's always that way. Hallelujah. The Word of God is true. I believe the Word of God. God describes two dinosaurs in the book of Job. And they, evidently they lived with Job because he talked to Job like he knew what they were. One of them, they both sound like dinosaurs. One of them sounds like what they used to call the dragons. There is words in the Bible that actually is, is translated dragons, which we call today dinosaurs. Before, before there was ever, it was in the 1850s that they invented the word for a dinosaur. Before that, they called them dragons. They had pictures like in several hundred years ago where a dragon tormented a town in England. There's a picture. It's a picture of a dinosaur. Dinosaurs have lived with man. God told Job, he said, I created them on the day I created you. Talk about the sixth day. To be in the Leviathan. So God's word is true. Hallelujah. Before, before the flood, the, the word was a different place. It was a different world than we have today. There was like one sea that covered all the land masses were together before the flood. Somebody says, words of where all the water go? It's in the oceans. That's where all the water went after the flood. And the land masses separated and the, and the, the parts of the earth that burst open and water gushed forth from the bowels of the earth. Now scientists just this past year have found that under the crust of the earth there's giant water reserves as much as the, as much or more that's on top of the earth. And there's got these vents underneath the sea at the bottom of the sea where water is just gushing out, out, of, out of the crust of the earth. It's still today. It's that water that's under the crust of the earth. And what happened is those, those, those hills that were covered up with water they all, when the, when the land masses separated, it pushed the mountains up. <clears throat> and so you've got, you've got like petrified trees going through several layers of, of that. Because when the flood happened, all the stuff was soft, this, this rock man. And it all settled in, into different sedimentary areas. It's really amazing. The creation, God's word is true. God's word is true. We've got to really understand that God's word really, really, really is true. Amen. It's really true. Amen. Hallelujah. 
It says in the book of Revelations, it says, at the, at the very end, there will be no more sun. It said, God will light the earth and everything that's in it. The light of God. God is light. God is light. God is love. Hallelujah. Praise you, Father. When we walk in the light, we're walking in the life of God. Thank you, Lord. So, replenish. It's in Genesis 1.28 and then Genesis 9.1. And God blessed them and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, which really means to fill the earth, and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And then chapter 9 of Genesis. This is after, after Noah, the flood in Noah. And God told Noah... Chapter 9, verse 1. And God sent it, and God blessed Noah. You see, God, at, after the flood, the only people that were left were like eight people that was on the ark. It was Noah, his wife, and his three sons and their wives. Only those eight people. Guess what? Everybody else came from them. Everybody else came from those eight people. All the people before the flood, they're all gone. Nobody else left. Methuselah had died the very same year of the flood. Isn't that something? He was Noah's great-grandfather, I believe. But Noah, when he died, he died 900 and some years old. So he still lived 300 and some years after the flood. Noah did. There were some of the patriarchs mentioned in the Bible that Noah was still alive mm -hmm. when they were around. That's amazing, isn't it? God's good. He's awesome. Paul's thorn in the flesh. That's in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul talks about the God given. The, he didn't say God given. He said it was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan. He told us what the thorn in the flesh was, the messenger of Satan. I had a minister a while back. He said, what do you think Paul's thorn in the flesh was? Oh, he said what it was. It was a messenger of Satan. The word messenger is angelos. In most places, it's translated angel. So it's an angel from Satan. It was tormenting him and buffeting him. To buffet means to beat with your fist. He was trying to stop him from, from getting the revelation that God had given him. Out. God had given him great revelation. And then God said, no. I hear, I, then I hear people say, God told Paul no when he asked three times, my grace is sufficient for me. For My grace is sufficient for you. I had the Lord speak this to one one time. Now, every time I heard a preacher preach that for my life, God said, I didn't say no. I mean, inside I heard this, I didn't say no, I didn't say no, I didn't say no. And then the one time the Lord spoke to me and he said this, what part of sufficient is no? What part of sufficient is no? My grace is sufficient. So Paul went on to say, therefore I'd rather give God glory in the middle of my troubles that the dunamis, miraculous power of God might rest upon me. What happens when the dunamis, miraculous power of God rests upon us? It brings us liberty. It brings us freedom. It delivers us. James says, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptations. That means all kinds of trouble. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. He said, as you allow patience to have its perfect work, then you'll become perfect and entire, lacking nothing. Give God praise. Give God glory when bad things happen. It's hard sometimes to give God glory when bad things happen. But that's what the Bible says to do. It says in Philippians chapter 4, it says, Be careful for nothing but in everything. By prayer, with petitions, and thanksgiving, let your requests be known unto God. That the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, would keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He goes on to say, whatsoever things are good, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are lovely, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So that's what God says. Do we do that? We need to start exercising these things in our life. Applying them to our life. God's Word is true. God's grace is sufficient for you. God has provided you through His grace Everything you need for life and godliness. That's in 2 Peter chapter 1. 
You have everything you need. It's already been given you. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man those things which God hath prepared. Now look, that hath is, is in the Greek. That one is. Hath prepared. There it is. I mean, it's a past tense word. Hath prepared. God's already prepared everything you need for life and godliness. We just got to get on track with the Word of God. In John chapter 9, verses 2 and 3, Jesus' disciples came to him and they said, There was a man who'd been who had been sick from his he'd been blind from his mother's womb since he was born. And Jesus said unto them, they said, Who has made this man sick? Why is this man sick? Is it his sins or his father or his parents' sins? It could have been his sins, he was born that way. So, I mean it could have been his parents' sins, but Jesus said neither. And then he went on to say, but that the will of God may be made manifest. Now what they did is the translators put that all together in one verse, which was a mistake. It was never designed to be together. It was designed to be like this, but that the will of God might be made manifest. I must do the will of him that sent me. So he went and he killed the man. So the miracle of God would be made manifest. God didn't make that man sick so he could heal him. You know they have nurses in hospitals. They make people sick so they can cure them. There's a, actually a name for that. You know what they do with that? those people? They put them in prison. You know why? That's evil. If God did that, he would be evil. We throw people in prison for doing that evil thing that we blame God for doing. God didn't make you sick. He doesn't need to make you sick. Bad things happen. The devil's trying to destroy people. And Jesus came to deliver, heal all those who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. He anointed him to heal people. Jesus came to do the will of him that sent him, and he healed the man. It's not God's will for you to be sick. Thank you, Father. I think I've covered all I was going to. That's my message. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father.